Hi guys, good morning. Good morning farm families. I am Allie from Maine's Confetti Quail Farm and I'm just gonna start doing these quick live videos on our Facebook page and I'm gonna also upload these videos to our website and to our YouTube channel just so you guys have some additional content to uh, look through and hopefully these questions and answers will give you some value as you are bringing up your quail babies and learning how to manage your flock. So, um, before we start, I just want to let you guys know that there's no silly questions. Um, I think that it's great that you guys are new if you're newbies and you're asking all these things because you're going to avoid some stress. Um, you're going to probably avoid some things happening that uh, you don't really want to experience if you just ask the questions, right? So I'm here to help you out and I am here to... Um, guide you the best I can. And just so you know, I will not be talking about anything unless I have direct experience with it. And of course, we're all learning. Whatever stage we're at, we're always learning something new when it comes to quail. So it's just an exciting journey and I'm glad to share this with you guys. So today we have, I have a notebook that I've been keeping when I get emails from customers um, or in our group. I just write this all down in a notebook, so there's no really order to this. I will go back and I'll list out the specific questions that were asked in the description of the videos, just so you guys have a quick reference, whether or not the video is something that you're looking for. Um, and yeah, continue to send them in and we'll have these, these Q and A's hopefully on a weekly basis. All right, so the first question is, what should you do with incubator eggs that don't develop? Um, or hatch. So I personally um, throw them away. They don't go into a compost pile. Uh, for me here, I don't want to attract any rodents, any types of uh, predators that I don't have to deal with that aren't here right now, just as just living in Maine. <laughs> we have raccoons and things like that. I don't want to um, bait them into the yard if I, if, if I can avoid it. So they don't end up in a compost pile. Um, I throw them away. With that said, we also uh, raise trout here on the farm. And I would love, love, love to be able to at some point figure out how to take those spent eggs because they are such a good protein source um, and learn or figure out how to pelletize them in some way to be able to use them for fish feed um, along with anything, any spent parts that, uh, that are a product of harvesting and all that stuff, but we haven't got there yet. If I figure that out, I will let you guys know because that is something that's on my to-do list that I would really like to be able to use those spent eggs for something. Um, but uh, for now, they end up in the trash. Hello, somebody's with us this morning. Hello, hello. Okay, so the next question, heat lamp or plate? So I use plates for my quail babies. Um, I love them and I typically wean them off of the plate within their first two weeks if our house is nice and warm. So they're on there for two weeks and then usually they're just in the brooder and they cuddle and they warm themselves that way after that point because they're most of their feathers are, are in other than their head um, at two weeks of age. Now, if you're keeping them outside, that would be a different story. You'd wanna keep them under a heat source for at least three to four weeks because you would want them fully feathered if you're dealing with external temperatures outside. Um, you can use a heat lamp also. I know a lot of people use the red lights. The only thing with that is that um, you don't wanna use those long-term so you don't want to use them past like three, four weeks because they'll actually cause the, the birds to develop faster and to mature faster um, and to start laying faster and start doing their, their breeding activities faster. And that's just not something that we need to push already in, in an accelerated way because these birds do grow so quickly. Um, so that's my thoughts on that. Issues with poop on quail feet aka poop balls <laughs> and if you guys have not kept quail um you probably don't know about these little this this little gift that we have to deal with but uh poop balls are common and they're really important to get soon get quickly so i have um i use two bedding methods i do a sand 
uh, bedding, just sand, partial time of year. And then I also do deep litter, partial time of the year. I don't keep any quail on um, wire flooring, but people who do keep them on wire flooring, they get these too. So it's just something that we're gonna have to keep an eye on and keep um, dealing with. And I uh, here really find them, um, I find them in young on younger birds because their droppings are a little softer. I, I think their tendency is their consistency is a little softer, a little stickier. Um, and in older birds, if I'm not really regularly turning that bedding on a daily basis, which I do, but if I miss a few days, that's when I can see like a little bit of a buildup happening. Um, and usually that's like winter months when it's just really cold for Allie to stay out there for a long time, but that's when that happens. When you see that, what it will be, it will be like a little hard ball that's, that's attached real hard, real like clinging on there, uh, like cement to their poor little toes. So what you want to do if you see that or when you see that is you want to soften it first. So I like to, um, treat that by getting a plastic tote, filling it with like half inch of water and some Epsom salt in there. And I'll just put the birds in that plastic tote with a lid that has holes drilled into it so they can't flush and fly out of there. But they walk around and they soften that stuff up that's on the bottoms of their feet. And um, they don't get wet that way either because you're not putting a lot of water in there. But after about 10 minutes or so, I'll take them out. I'll test it to see if it's softened enough. And then sometimes I can just kind of like remove them with my fingers and usually that works just fine. Uh, a note for that though is if they're really on there and if they're bigger, it's going to be tough to get them off and you might have to work a little harder at it. And sometimes you can accidentally pull their little toenail off and then that can start a lot of bleeding. So what I also like to have on hand when I'm doing that is blue coat. Okay, it's a spray, uh, germicidal, fungicidal, and obviously it's on my hands right now. I use this a lot, but what this does, it's like a liquid band aid. So if you don't have blue coat, something like this will work also. This or this. Okay, an antiseptic spray that's safe for poultry. But the benefit of this is that it will kind of like do a, a little layer of um, like a protective layer on there. And if there is bleeding, it will mask that red color, which is what we want when we're dealing with quail with any types of injuries, large or small. We want to mask that blood color because then if other babies or other, other other adults see that red, that's when they start kind of pecking at each other and that's not a good thing. So this works for that and it works great. I get all of these um, sprays off of Amazon and I think they're like under $20 a piece. So having those on hand is really, really good. Um, Epsom salt bath too is a great preventative when it comes to um, preventing things like bumblefoot, any type of foot infection. Um, it's really great. I do. I tend to do foot baths once every month or so um, when the weather is nice. Not so much during the winter time because we're dealing with lots of freezing temperatures in Maine. But if you can do it even once every few months, your birds are going to be that much better for it. So. Okay, um, what kind of wire should you use for flooring? So I just mentioned this, but I personally don't use wire. Um, if you're going to use wire, make sure you Google it and make sure that it's the type that's got that coating on there so you're not dealing with any kind of cuts in the bottom of, or not causing any kind of cuts on the bottom of your bird's feet. Um, but again, I won't speak too much about the wire because it's not something I use. What I do use, I'll explain to you my little um, bedding system here. So in the, let's start with summer. In the summer months, I have all of my birds in their hutches with at least a couple of inches of uh, play sand that I get from Lowe's. Then I clean that out with a kitty litter scoop. That's all I've got in there for summer and then going into fall, um, they're on sand. When it starts getting colder, I will transition them to a deep litter bedding for the fall, winter, and early spring months. And the reason for that is 
during the summer when it's hot, that moisture and that sand is easily evaporated and it's really easy to clean and it keeps the birds really happy. And, um, and it's just, it's just something that I like, that I like having them on versus wire. Um, I'm not dealing with predators that are reaching under the wire and grabbing toes and all that stuff. So that's what I go with, with, uh, during those months. Come fall, um, when the temperatures get a little colder and winter, especially when the temperatures are colder, that moisture in that sand is not going to be evaporating. And that sand is going to be a hard block that they end up standing on. And then their waste is going to sit on top of it. And it's not something that you want to deal with during the winter months. So my process when it gets to fall and it, we get our like first snow, like at the end of October, I'll start putting in um, alfalfa hay. I'll start putting in, if I have any extra pine shavings, things like that, I'll start putting layers of that on top of the sand that's been in there um, throughout the summer. And continue doing that. And what I'll use is one of those like three pronged handheld uh, garden rakes and I will turn that bedding every day. So when I go out and I will do the waters or if, I, if I'm filling feeders or if I'm collecting eggs, that's just something that I do during that time also, just to um, put more oxygen in that bedding to mix it up so the waste is not sitting on that top layer only. Um, and what you're, what you're gonna see happening is your bedding is going to start composting and that those droppings in there are going to start composting with the bedding. So what you're gonna do, or what I do, is I use that time of year to create my garden compost within my hutches and then take that out a couple times during the winter time when I see that it's getting really thick and put it in a compost pile. And that is what I'll actually use on my gardens and in my orchard area come springtime, right? So by that time, it's already sat most of the winter. That nitrogen and ammonia and all that stuff is has... Um, has gone down as far as like whether or not it's safe to use on plants. And then by planting season, we're good to go and we we build our soil. I use the no-till method. Um, and I just use all of that garden gold that was produced by those quail in those hutches throughout those months in a different way come um, spring and summer. Now, when I do clean them out fully in the springtime, that, that's when I'll replace only with sand again, and it's just that cycle over and over. So that's what we use instead of wire flooring. Okay. What is a segregation pen and what are some types? So when I talk about a segregation pen, I mean a separate housing unit for birds that are injured, um, for birds that may be sick, uh, birds that you're trying to see which color egg they lay, any kind of reason why you would want to separate one bird and observe that bird or take care of that bird alone um, for a, a period of time. There are different ways that I do it here on the farm. I have typically have um, free hutches available, so I may just move one bird to an empty hutch. But what comes along with that is the challenge of reintegrating them into their group after I've removed them for a certain amount of time. So what I really like to use instead, when I, when I can, is um, a separate pen that's like, I use a hamster pen hamster cage and I like the really clear looking cages. I mine is called a crisp crystal something. Crystal habitat. Anyway, it's see-through. I got it off of Amazon. It was like 20 something dollars, I think. And um it comes with a little water bottle, which is great. And what I'll do with that is I'll actually put it right into the hutch that that bird is normally in with their entire group. My hutches are big enough to accommodate that. So that's what I really love doing. It, it does a few things. It keeps that bird separate and I can give whatever kind of medicine I need to or um, let the injury heal up, um, put extra electrolytes and stuff in their water if I need to. But what I love is that it doesn't require 
an integrate a reintegration process because that bird is always within that space that it's used to being in with those birds that it's used to it's used to living with. So um, visually, everybody can still see each other. And there's no like, oh, that bird's gone and now that bird's back and we need to redo this whole pecking order thing, right? Because quail can be like dramatic. So so that's what I really love to use for segregation pens. Um, and something to keep in mind when you're building your quill hutches is get your segregation pen first and make sure that you build your hutch to accommodate that size pen, right? Or if you've already got your hutch build, just make sure that you're paying attention to the dimensions of your pen. Um, but that's been working great for me. I really, really love that. And um, it also means that I don't have to house injured birds or sick birds inside because I have like 200 birds. I don't need them in the house, right? <laughs> right? Okay, so beak trimming. All right, so once in a while, you may get a bird that you're seeing is like growing this like Pinocchio beak. And it's like, what the heck is going on, right? <laughs> What's wrong with this bird? Sometimes you'll just get one that, that just overgrows. And I keep a couple tools in my pocket. I've only had one like this out of like maybe 300. And I will keep these things in my pocket. A nail trimmer i think it's more like a cuticle trimmer is what this is specifically um but you guys can get these anywhere like in any kind of walgreens or hanford or anything like that um they're right where the regular nail clippers are i love this style because i can go in at any angle and just trim that beak instead of just like straight on like a regular nail clipper would. I love, love, love these. They're really sharp, but they're also really precise and they're tiny, so they're perfect for quail beaks. And then after I do this, I'll just give it a little run across with a fingernail file. It's just regular grit, um, just to make sure that there's no sharp edges for that bird to deal with or um, for the, them to accidentally injure another bird in there. So. Um, some people get nervous about beak trimming. I get nervous about beak trimming too. I don't like doing it, but it's really easy because typically they'll grow out like a fingernail and you can see um, which part of the beak you should trim off. There is blood flow in there, so you definitely don't wanna go too far. But if you're looking, um, most of the time the beak, the overgrowth will be translucent in color and, and just stay away from the tongue and you're gonna be good to go. Now. To avoid having to do this, there are some things that you can put into your hutch, like um, cuddle bones that you put in like a, par like a parakeet cage um, would work. Mine don't really typically go towards the cuddle bones. I've hung them in there and they just kind of leave them alone. Um, so I go with just regular rocks, like um, a rounded granite something that has like that texture to it not like a super smooth one but a texture to it you could put a brick in there um that they can uh just grind down their beak on their own um and they'll grind down their nails naturally on that too if they are hopping up on it and stuff like that so just stick a brick or a rock in their cage and typically they'll deal with um trimming their own nails and beak on their own so if you guys have questions while I'm reading, go ahead and put them in the comments. If I don't get to them in this video, I'll do another one soon. Um, dust bathing. Okay, dust bathing and food. Okay, quail like to dust bathe in just about everything. If they dust bathe in their food, that's normal, but you don't really wanna deal with that because it's a lot of food waste. So providing them with a dust bath is going to keep them happy enrichment wise and it's going to keep them clean and it's going to rid them of any kind of bugs and all that stuff um, which is another reason why I only do sand in the hutches during the summertime because bugs don't like to live in there if you do deep litter all year long you're going to deal with bugs you're going to deal with flies and all that stuff um but dust baths are great and I like to have my birds have access to it all the time um for the dust bath, again, the play sand is what I choose. I know a lot of people use dirt um, from their yard, but there's reasons why I stay away from that. For one, I don't want them to be eating earthworms 
because they can um, ingest additional parasites. Uh, also, the reason why I don't keep them on the ground in a run like that on the ground, um, they can ingest parasites. They can pick up other things um, that are in the ground that you don't want them like uh, wild birds carry viruses all that stuff right uh we work really hard to keep our birds safe and healthy so anytime that we bring stuff in from outside that environment we don't know what we're going to be exposing them to so um yeah no earthworms um I stick to play sand, uh, no beach sand because there's a lot of salt and stuff in that. It's just, you know, play sand's good. Um, also I will provide my adults during the winter time when we're using the wood stoves, I will collect the ash from the wood stoves and I will let them dust bathe in wood ash. They love that too. Um, but I do make sure that I'm only using that with adult aged birds. Um, my next question on here actually was had to do with dust bathing too and it was uh how old how old um do birds need to be before you give them a dust bath i start giving my babies dust baths when they're about two weeks old um because they can get kind of you know the brooder's not super great you know and they can't they can't get grit from the brooder and all that stuff usually like if you're starting them on a game bird feed there's no grit in that so i do like to be able to give them a dust bath come two weeks um so they're getting the grit and they're getting clean and for enrichment it's just so fun they're just they love it so much um and um yeah, no sooner than that because they can start, they can, if they're really little, they can ingest a lot of sand and then fill their, um, their crop up with it. And then, you know, it's just, they, they should be, they should be, I'd say at least 10 days old. Um, let's see. Oh, and I also don't, don't use diatomaceous earth in my dust baths. I know as a lot of people do. Um, but I have not found the need for it. And if you use too much, it can cause some like respiratory issues and stuff because it can kind of cake up their nose and all that stuff. So I don't personally use diatomaceous earth and dust, ba and dust baths. Okay, how do you keep eggs clean? All right, so if your hutches are clean, your eggs are gonna be clean. Um, I think keeping sand for the substrate my eggs are clean all summer, all, all summer long. They, they just stay really, really nice in the sand. Um, deep litter method is a little different. They will get dirtier in a deep litter um, because they'll kick the deep litter around and they tend to like bury the eggs a little bit accidentally when they're doing, you know, their quail stuff. So they can get a little dirtier in that, um, in that type of bedding. Um, but you could also do egg rollouts. So if you have a wire floor, you can set it up so it's tilted. And then when they lay, their eggs will just roll right out. And you can do it that way too. Um, yeah, so that's what I do. That's what I do. They stay pretty good. If you're on top of your cleaning, you're, you're good to go. Your, your eggs will be nice. Um, should you eat frozen eggs? I do. As long, as long as the eggs aren't like um, cracked to the point where the membrane's been open, I'll eat them. I just put them that time of year when they're coming from a really cold environment, I'll keep them in the refrigerator. They're not ones that I would store on the counter um, like I would like in springtime, summertime. Um, but yeah, if the membrane's not broken, I'd eat them. I don't know if that's the right thing to do, but <laughs> that's what I do. Should you wash your eggs? Um, I don't wash my eggs unless it's right before I'm cooking with them. Then I will wash them in warm water, not cold water. Um, if you wash them with cold water, uh, more things, more like bacteria and stuff can penetrate in that shell. So I wash with warm water right before use and it's a quick wash. It's not like a soak them wash. Um, but typically when I'm keeping them on the counter, uh, I will not wash them because they'll keep longer that way. If you let the bloom stay where the bloom is. Okay. Um, and especially if you're going to be incubating your eggs, you don't want to wash your eggs ever. So there's that. So uh, a lot of questions about eggs. Um, storing eggs long term. So there, you could dehydrate your eggs. I don't 
I don't personally dehydrate my eggs, but I do um, water glass my eggs and I will pickle my eggs. So water glassing is the method that I will use if I want the eggs to stay, to stay as they are in an uncooked form and an unflavored form, just like fresh eggs. Um, and what I do for that is I have a big five gallon bucket that sits on my counter and I'll do this come fall if, um, if I've got just an excess of eggs, if I'm not heavily hatching that time of year. Um, what you can do is you can go to the store in the canning, in the canning aisle, the preservation, food preservation aisle, and you can grab um, a bag of food safe pickling lime. And the ratio for that is one ounce per quart of water you're using. So one ounce of the pickling lime powder per one quart of water. Make a solution submerge your eggs unwashed into that solution. And as long as they're under that level, that water level, they're gonna preserve that way. And they'll keep, I mean, within a year, like you'll use them. You probably won't let them sit there longer than a year, but I've heard that they, let, they can last up to like two years. I don't know, I use them before that. Um, a year is the most I keep them. But, um, Whenever you want to use the eggs from that solution, you can just go in there, grab what you need, rinse them off, and they're good to go. There is another method that's like a mineral oil method. I don't do that, so I won't speak on it, but go ahead and free, free, feel free to Google. Um, and then pickling is something that we love to do here. I get a lot of chicken eggs and a lot of quail eggs. Um, so pickling is great. We have them constantly in the fridge. We have them constantly as gifts that we give out to people uh, just to be nice. You know, we have, we have them all the time, all the time. And for those, uh, I just do a really simple recipe. Um, I typically use white vinegar. Um, I really like malt vinegar too, and I like them really tangy. So what I'll do is I will boil my eggs um, to peel them, a little trick is to put them in like a bigger mason jar with a little bit of water on them, like fill the mason jar halfway, give it a really good shake with a little water in there and the lid on, and um, that will crack up the shell and it's just a lot easier to, to peel the shells off that way. And once you get your eggs boiled, I'll pop a pot of um, white vinegar on my stove with whatever kind of um, spice seasonings that I like. Typically, I'll put a bay leaf, I'll put black pepper corns in there, um, a little bit of sea salt to taste, not iodized salt, just regular sea salt, um, red pepper flakes, mustard seed. Um, sometimes I'll do dried dill, um, but I just keep it really simple. And I also like to put in um, sometimes like those canned jalapeno peppers in there to just give them a little bit of a kick in there. Um, but that's, that's about it. Keep it really easy and simple. So once that mixture is hot on the stove, you don't need to bring it to a boil. It's just to simmer it and, and um, get those herb flavors, right, inside that vinegar. Then just top off your jar that's filled with your pickled eggs or a pill filled with your eggs with that brine and cap it and you can put it in the fridge. You don't need to put it through a um, canner, but you can. So if I know that I'm gonna store mine for more than like a couple of months, then I run it into, I just put it, put the jars through a water canner and it will um, preserve them longer that way. And you know how to use refrigeration if you do that, but it's not necessary because if you're just using straight vinegar, it's gonna kill all those bad, nasty things anyway. And you keep them in the fridge, they're good to go. They're fine. You're fine, they're fine. Don't worry about it. <laughs> okay. Um, can quail be cold and still be okay during the winter times outside? Yeah, okay. So yes, quail can be really cold <laughs> and still be okay. Um, as long, I, I find that the deep litter keeps them warmer because the, the hutches are better insulated for, uh, for the winter time. And it gives them something to kind of crawl into and bury themselves a little bit in. Um, so I love deep litter for that reason in Maine, during the winter in Maine. Um, I have never kept quail on wire 
during the winter time. So I'm not sure if there's a difference there as far as their, um, their ability to be cold tolerant, but I know that they are very, very hardy and they do just fine here. Um, as long as you're giving them a good wind break, a good um, snow break and no rain or snows getting in there, they're gonna be fine. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about that. Um, heat, I think is the bigger thing that we deal with. I put my hutches out, out away from direct sunlight because the summer can be kind of hot and they can, they can, cause a little stress on the birds in the heat. So that might be um, more of a challenge for you depending on how much direct sun your pen gets. Um, can quail hatch their own chicks? This is probably gonna be, yeah, this will be the last question that I'll answer in this video, but do quail hatch their own chicks? They can. I have yet to have a broody hen though. Um, I think they've just been bred for so long, just. They're, it's just not really within them much anymore to, to have that desire like a broody chicken would. Um, but I do know that it's possible. And the more natural of an environment that they have, the more stress-free of an environment they have, um, they're more likely to. But I wouldn't count on that as being your way that you're going to produce more chicks for your flock. I would definitely invest in an incubator if you want to have chicks on a regular basis, seasonal basis. Um, and you may end up with a lucky broody hen once in a great while, but, um, but yeah, I've yet to have one here. So, um, and our hutches are pretty natural, I think, but not, no, not yet. If I do, I'll let you guys know. So, um, yeah, so I think that's good for this video. I don't want to make these too long, but hopefully you found one nugget that uh, is interesting to you and you can take that with you. Um, but if you guys have any additional questions, let me know. I'll add it to my little handy dandy notebook and <laughs> I'll hop on again and make sure that you guys get your answers. So anyway, I'll talk to you guys later. I hope you have a great day. Bye.